What's going on guys, my name is Matt and today I have a very special video for you. I often get a lot of questions from people asking what's the least they have to spend to get into PC gaming using all new parts. Usually I'd recommend going used at this price point, but as you'll see in this video, this computer is perfect for games like Fortnite, CSGO, and Overwatch. The price point of this build is $300, and not only am I going to be showing you the parts and telling you why I picked them, but I'm also going to show you how to put everything together step by step, and then show you how it performs in a bunch of games. Before I go any further, I want to tell you this video is in partnership with Micro Center. If you have a Micro Center near you, I would highly recommend checking it out. It's the best in-person store for buying PC parts. They have a lot of good deals, and if you were to build the system by buying some of your parts from Micro Center, you could save a fair bit of money through combo deals and other discounts. They're not paying me, but they did provide some of the parts in this video, so I want to thank them for making this video possible. Going into this build, I knew I was going to have to go the APU route if I wanted to build a $300 system using parts from Amazon and Newegg. I picked parts at the time that were a good value for the money, but prices change all the time so I'll leave a few options for any parts that have had major price changes. What I was able to put together for $300 is a well polished machine with respectable performance. So now that you've got a good idea of what this system is all about, let's go ahead and talk about the parts that make up this $300 gaming PC. I usually start planning a build by picking a CPU or in this case an APU. What I went with is the Ryzen 3 3200G. This combines both a powerful CPU and GPU into one small chip. Inside the 3200G is a quad core CPU based on the Zen Plus architecture. Yes, even though it is a 3000 series, it's actually not on Zen 2 which might be surprising to some. The 3200G has a base clock of 3.5GHz and can turbo up to 3.7GHz. This is decent but the cool thing is that this is an unlocked CPU so we'll be able to overclock it for extra performance and I'll show you the best settings to do so later in the video. Having a quad core CPU means that in the future if you add a powerful dedicated graphics card then you will be able to play pretty much any game. While this build doesn't have a dedicated graphics card what it does have is Vega 8 graphics baked into the 3200G. It has 8 compute units and runs at 1250 megahertz. Again this is good and the built-in graphics can also be overclocked. All this combined for 90 to 90 $5, you're getting a really good value and a very good starting place for upgrades in the future. Another place where Ryzen APUs shine is in the fact they come with decent coolers in the box. This is the Wraith Stealth Cooler which looks pretty good in my opinion. It's a pretty basic aluminum cooler but it gets the job done and doesn't affect the budget at all because it comes free with our APU. It is pre-applied thermal paste, is super simple to install and can actually handle a mild overclock. In terms of the motherboard, I went with what is my favorite AM4 motherboard the ASRock B450M Pro 4. For $75 you're getting a really good feature set and fun fact this is the motherboard I use in my personal rig and it handles a Ryzen 7 2700 at 4.1 GHz no problem. It has plenty of PCIe slots for expansion, dual M.2 slots which is something you don't even see that often on mid-range boards, it has 4 DIMM slots and the VRM setup is actually pretty decent. This is the perfect board to start with because there are so many upgrade and expansion options. Moving on to RAM, this is an area where I wanted to focus a lot of attention. Ryzen APUs depend heavily on fast RAM to perform well. With this being said, the budget was very tight so some compromises had to be made. What I ended up getting was this 2x4GB kit of G-Skill Ripjaws DDR4 RAM at 3200 MHz. This works well for this build, but if you have an extra $20, going up to 16GB would be a very good idea. 3200 MHz is a good sweet spot for price to performance DDR4 RAM. Being a 2 stick kit is also very important because it means our RAM will run in dual channel operation. Also the motherboard in this build has 4 RAM slots, so upgrading to 16GB is as easy as popping in 2 more 4GB sticks. Next up, let's talk about storage. SSDs are getting very cheap, making it even possible to have one in this $300 PC build. What I went with is this 240GB Inland Professional SSD that I picked up for around $25. This particular drive may not be at that price anymore, but I'll leave links to other 240GB SSD options around the $25 price point. 240GB is plenty of space for your OS, applications, and some games. And you can always add more storage later down the line in the 
form of a hard drive or another SSD. While 240GB is okay to start with, I wouldn't ever really recommend someone start with a 120GB SSD just because it's too little space and going to a 240GB drive isn't much more expensive. This Inland Professional SSD is definitely a lower end drive, but an SSD like this is going to be miles better than a mechanical hard drive. Powering the system is a 450 watt Seasonic S12 III. Power supply prices are pretty bad right now, but for a little over $40, I was able to get this unit with 450 watt 80 plus bronze efficiency and all black cables. This unit looks and performs great and Seasonic is a very well respected and highly regarded power supply manufacturer. 450 watts is way more than enough for this build and is plenty for when you decide to upgrade to a dedicated graphics card with external PCIe power requirements. Finally, let's talk about the case. For a little over $30, I was able to get this Deep Cool Matrix 30 from Newegg. Normally, I would have tried to spend less on a case for this price of a build, but because this was only a few dollars more than the cheapest case on Newegg when factoring and shipping, it made sense to spend the extra 4 or $5 to get this case. Now, this is very much a budget case with a fair bit of compromises, but for $30, I think this is an amazing value for the money. Firstly, it has a tempered glass side panel, something you rarely ever see at this price point. It has a design that I really Really like. The front has decent ventilation and it comes included with a rear 120mm fan. With a lot of work I was able to get cable management looking decent and overall this is probably my new favorite case under $35. Altogether for $300 you're getting a great starter PC with lots of room for upgrades and with enough performance to play popular titles with ease. So now that you've seen all the parts and learned about why I chose each of them, it's time to show you how to put this all together with a step by step guide. I know you guys like this for the last couple of builds so I decided to do it for this build also. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble the system but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you will really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a pair of pliers. I'd highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver this will make building the PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. Next let's talk about static. I personally don't worry about it and have never had had any issues or problems with it. If you live in a very dry place or are worried about it, you can use an anti-static ground strap like this one or periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule clear and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. Again, there are a number of different orders and ways to assemble this PC, but I'll show you the steps I went through to assemble mine. Start by getting out your motherboard box. Open it up and grab out the IO shield, the SATA cables, the manual, and the motherboard itself. Take the board out of the bag and carefully set it on your table. Put the bag back in the box, close it up, and set the motherboard on top of the box. Now go ahead and get your CPU box out. Open it up and pull the cooler box and the CPU clamshell out. Open up the clamshell and set it to the side, bringing your attention back to the motherboard. Locate the socket at the center, push down and out on the metal lever arm, then lift up so it's perpendicular to the board. Pick your CPU up, handling it only by the edges, and align the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. Another way to know it's oriented correctly is to align the AMD 3200G name parallel to the part of the socket that says socket AM4, then just lower it into place and close the socket in the reverse order in which you opened it. Next, to prepare your motherboard for installing our cooler, we need to remove these two plastic pieces. You just unscrew two screws from each and they lift away, but make sure to leave the back plate in place because we need it to install our cooler. Next, grab the cooler box and open it up. As you can see, there's pre-applied thermal paste on the bottom of the cooler, so make sure not to touch that part. Grab the cooler and lower it into place, aligning the screws with the holes in the back plate and the AMD logo facing the back I.O. Then tighten down the four screws in a cross pattern to ensure even pressure across the CPU. This part is totally optional, but if you want the AMD logo sticking up, Unscrew the four small screws that connect the fan to the heatsink, rotate the fan 90 degrees, then reinstall these screws. Next, locate the CPU fan header at the top right of the board and align the notch in the fan connector with the notch in the header and lower it into place. You can now press the cable under the fan shroud to neaten things up a bit. Now bring your attention to the dim slots on your motherboard. Open up the clips on slot 2 and 4 just as I've done in the video. Now grab your sticks one at a time and align the notch in the RAM stick with the notch in the slot and lower it into place. Once lowered in, press down until you hear a click noise and the clips close. Repeat this for the second stick. Now you can set your motherboard to the side and get out your case. 
Open it up, flip it upside down, and lift the cardboard box away. Now make sure to shock yourself with any remaining static on the case. Flip it so the feet are facing up and remove that piece of foam. Expose the feet from the bag, flip it back up, and lift the foam and bag away. Start by removing the back panel by unscrewing each thumb screw, one at the top and one at the bottom. Pull the panel back and lift it away. Now set the case on its side and unscrew the four thumb screws holding the glass panel into place. Make sure to put these in a safe place. Now lift the glass up and away from the case. It's a good idea to put the foam, the bag, and both of the side panels back into the case box to make sure they don't get knocked over or damaged. Now grab the IO shield we took out of the motherboard box before and line it up like this and press all four corners into place. This is kind of annoying to do but just make sure it's secure and in place. Now lift the case up and pull from the bottom of the front panel to disconnect the front panel from the main part of the case. Pull all these cables out then fish each one through this hole right here. Cable management is difficult in this case so I had to be very thoughtful very early on in the build about how things will be routed. With that done you can press the front panel back into place by pressing the four corners. Now take all these cables and route them down through this hole here. I then used one of the zip ties included in the case screw bag to hold all the cables in place. Now set the case to the side and grab out your power supply. Pull the power supply itself, the AC power cable, and the screws from the box. Undo the twist tie but don't throw it away, we need it in a second. Now pull aside the 24 pin cable that looks like this, the 4 plus 4 pin CPU cable that looks like this, and one of the SATA cables that looks like this. Now bundle the rest of the cables back up and resecure them with the twist tie from earlier as we won't be needing these and doing this keeps them neat and out of the way. Now with the fan side facing down slide the power supply into the case and make sure the holes in it match up with the holes in the back. Now take the four screws that came in the power supply box and screw one into each hole to secure the power supply into place. Now push all the front panel cables into the front of the case like this so they're out of the way and flip the case onto its side. Now we need to move and install a few extra standoffs from the screw bag that look like this. We need to unscrew this one and move it down here. I used a nut driver bit on my multi-tool but a pair of pliers would work fine also. Now install an extra standoff to the bottom right of the large cutout here and one to the top right of the large cutout here. Now with the case on its side, take your motherboard and lower it into place lining the IO up with the IO shield. Make sure you align the board so you can see the standoffs through the motherboard holes. Take your motherboard screws that look like this and start by just installing one in the bottom middle of the board. This part is totally optional, but if you want clean cable management then route the 8 pin CPU cable to the back of the case with the case standing up and push the connector up behind the motherboard like this. This keeps you from having to route the cable across the board and allows for a very clean look. Pull the cable out so there's 3 or 4 inches of slack, then set the cable back onto its side. I next align the clip on the connector with the notch on the header and press the CPU cable into place. Here's another view of how it goes in. You can now install the rest of the motherboard screws. Now go ahead and get out your SSD. The mount in this case is very weird. It pressure fits in by sliding into place like this. Make sure the logo is facing up and the end where the cables connect is facing the back of the case. Now take the straight SATA cable that we pulled out of the motherboard box earlier and plug one end into the motherboard. It only goes in one way and here's another angle which may make it easier to see. Now take the other end and plug it into the SSD. We can now take our 24 pin cable and route it to the back of the case and we can do the same with our SATA power cable. We can now return the front panel cables to the back of the case also. Take the HD audio and route it through this hole here. Next do the same with the USB 2 cable and then do the same with all of the small front panel cables. Next take the SATA power cable and plug it into the SSD by routing it through this hole. Here's a better look at how it plugs in. Finally take the 24 pin cable and route it through here. Also I forgot to mention to route the USB 3 cable through here. Now flip the case back onto its side. Grab the USB 3 cable aligning the notch in both the connector and header together then press it into place. Now take the 24 pin cable and align the clip with the notch and press it into place. Take the HD audio cable and plug it into the audio header towards the bottom left of the board. Look at the pins on the header and the holes in the connector to make sure everything is lined up. Now take the USB 2 connector and plug it into one of the USB 2 headers, lining the holes in the connector with the pins on the header then pressing it into place. Now referring to the motherboard manual, plug in the small front panel connectors into the header on the bottom right of the board.
Now you can flip the case back onto its feet. Pull any excess cabling from the main part of the case to the back of the case so as little cable as possible is in the main chamber. Now use the included zip ties to neaten and secure all the cables in the back. Try and hide these cables behind the motherboard tray and try to make them as flat as possible. There's not much room for cables so when reinstalling the back panel you may need to smush it down and while holding it down slide it into place. This may take a few tries but as long as everything is relatively flat you should be able to get it to close and make sure to reinstall the two thumb screws from before also. Now flip the case over and set the glass onto it upside down. This will allow you to clean the part of the glass that will be inside the case. I use some regular glass cleaner and paper towel to clean it but a microfiber cloth would work fine also. With it clean carefully flip it over, reinstall the four thumb screws and clean this side too. My camera died while I was cleaning this side but this is the final step. With the system put together, it now means it's time to install Windows. You'll need a USB stick to install Windows and I won't be going over how to install Windows in this video, but I have a full video about how to use Windows for free unactivated, with the only caveat being it'll have a little activate Windows modder mark in the bottom right corner. You can now install all the drivers which I'll link in the description below. But before you play any games, we need to make a very important adjustment in the BIOS. I'll be talking about overclocking later, but even if you're not going to overclock, you need to do this step. Shut down your PC, then press to turn it back on. After pressing the power button, mash the delete key on your keyboard to bring up the BIOS. Press the right key on your keyboard, then arrow down to the load XMP option. Press enter and change it from auto to XMP 2.0 profile 1 and then hit enter. Arrow down once more over DRAM frequency, press enter and make sure 3200MHz is selected and press enter again. Now arrow to the left twice to get into the exit tab, hit enter to save changes and exit then hit enter again to confirm these changes. What we just did was ensure that our RAM will be running at its correct speed which has a huge impact on gaming performance. If you're not overclocking, you're now ready to hop into your games and enjoy your new PC. Before I talk about overclocking, I want to go over the stock performance of the system without any overclocking and with the correct XMP profile enabled to show you the stock performance. So I tested a few different games that I thought someone with a system like this would want to play. Starting off with Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings, the system average 62 FPS with 1% lows of 50, which honestly was a pretty smooth and enjoyable experience. I haven't had too much experience with APUs in the past, but this performance at stock speeds honestly impressed me. Next I tested CSGO at 1080p competitive settings and this system receives an average of 136 FPS with 1% lows of 87. This was a pretty good experience too and overall gameplay seemed pretty smooth. The third game I tested was Overwatch at 1080p low settings with 100% resolution scaling. The system receives an average of 91 FPS with 1% lows of 70. This again was surprising to me and I felt this offered a great experience. Next in Rainbow Six at 1080p medium settings, the system received an average of 76 FPS using the built-in benchmark, which is good to see it's a fair bit above 60. Finally, I tested PUBG which at 1080p low settings averaged around 44 FPS with 1% lows of 30. This was technically playable but definitely wasn't enjoyable. This overall was good performance across these games but remember the CPU can be overclocked pretty easily. To do so, head back into the BIOS and go over to the OC Tweaker tab. Arrow down to CPU frequency and change it from auto to manual. For a quick and dirty overclock you can change the frequency to 4000 which is 4GHz and change the voltage to 1.375V. Now head down to GFX and change it from auto to 1650, then change the GFX core voltage to 1.3. Then just go ahead and save changes and exit. This will give you a pretty decent boost in performance and for example in Rainbow Six took the FPS from 76 up to 88 average just by doing this quick little change in the BIOS and in many cases the increase in performance will be even bigger. Overall for $300 you're getting a great PC to start with using all new parts. The performance is good and the system doesn't look half bad either. Again thank you to Micro Center for providing some of the parts for this video. Please check to see if you have a Micro Center near you as they have amazing in-store deals. I'll have a link to their website in the description so make sure to check it out. So yeah guys I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed this build guide. I enjoyed making it but it was definitely a lot of work. If you guys want to see a build guide at a specific price point let me know in the comment section below and I'll try and do the ones that seem to be the most popular. 
If you guys enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you really enjoyed it, then please consider subscribing. And if you really, really liked it, then sharing it on social media would be greatly appreciated. And I almost forgot one thing. This is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.